Okay, uh, thanks very much, Piotr. We, um, we are connected by World Bank Project, the Jobs Knowledge Platform. So um, that's what makes a previously orthogonal relationship non-orthogonal. Uh, and um, so it's the first time to Warsaw, and so there's nothing like giving you a quick tour of South Africa while I'm in Warsaw. I feel connected to Piotr because last night he told me he's a big rugby fan. So if you know South Africa, we're all rugby lovers. So, so I'm even more connected to this uh, Polish gentleman next to me. So what I'll try and do is three, three things. First is one slide just to give you a quick overview of what South Africa looks like, um, big sort of pic big picture economic overview, and then um, contextualize the South African labor market, uh, looking mainly at developing countries in Latin America, and apologies to the audience, there's no data on Poland, but you could sort of connect that with your own data, but then spend a lot of the time around the minimum wage issues in South Africa, um, and, and hopefully bring out some of the sort of common themes that have been discussed this morning. So what are we? We are a country of about 52 million people. We are an upper middle income country according to the uh, sort of World Bank classifications. That's around about half of what Chile's uh, GDP per capita is, a little bit about, around about where China is. Um, essentially, uh, low inflation economy, we're an inflation targeting regime, so between 2 and 6% is our inflation rate. Um, we have... Um, sort of uh, interest rates that uh, hover around 8 to 12 percent in that band um, and precarious in my view outward orientated economy but an undynamic uh, heavy capital intensive manufacturing sector most of our exports are resource based and even where they are manufacturing uh, they tend to be capital intensive so that's sort of the nature of the economy in in one slide uh, that's the stock outlier results. So we are a highly unequal society. Despite the upper middle income country status, uh, we probably, uh, well certainly in the middle income country status, the most unequal country in that sample. For countries that we have data that are not at war and do not have sort of negative shocks, we're probably the most unequal society in the world. So that's, that's a particular noteworthy aspect of this economy. Partly driven by what's happening in the labor market the inequality story. So what you have here are a sort of sample of upper middle income countries. Again, apologies, there's no Poland here, but uh, South Africa's got an unemployment rate that hovers since democracy, so since apartheid ended between 22 and 27 um, percent. The, the latest rate is at about 25, which as you can see is far higher than any of the other comparator upper middle income country numbers that you see. The closest you have, I think, is Serbia, uh, which is at about 15, 16%, but the upper middle income country average is half that of South Africa. So what you have is a labor market that's first and foremost defined by one of the highest unemployment rates uh, that you're likely to see in comparator economies. So that sort of almost closes that labor market model, but but digging a bit deeper, what happens is in most, as we know, in most developing countries, your labor market gets closed, as it were, by uh, some form of informal sector employment. We capture this here, you know, the, the World Bank data doesn't give us informal sector as much as they give us self-employment, right? Uh, data outside of agriculture. And that's the South Africa number there, right at the bottom, right? So almost as a mirror image of what's going on in terms of uh, uh, labor supply, um, or excess labor supply, you've got a very small informal sector. In comparison with most other, um, mainly Latin American economies, and I've got Vietnam there as well. Um, and so the notion that you have a, uh, an upper middle income country that has a high Gini can be almost matched onto this extraordinarily high unemployment rate that's partly driven by the fact that the informal sector is so small. And we, uh, there's not enough time, but we can talk about why that is the case. In other countries, like India in particular, and large parts of South Asia, the other way in which economic activity is generated is through agriculture, um, mainly subsistence agriculture and, and so on. But in South Africa, uh, shares of employment, and I'll come back to the minimum wage in agriculture, that's a big part of my story, but even if, you, um, even if you control for that, the proportion of individuals employed in agriculture is very, very small compared to other economies, right? Uh, and I've deliberately uh, sort of stayed away from high uh, 
uh, agricultural employment economies like India and so on. And even in that sample, um, South Africa is very low. I presented this figure in, um, at the wider conference in Vietnam, and um, you, know, you can see the big difference in terms of informal sector employment in Vietnam compared to um, South Africa. So, and, and that's partly to do with the fact that we've got a very large scale capital intensive, mainly white owned, historically white owned um, agricultural sector. And so that doesn't generate enough nodes of opportunity for small scale black agriculture. Um, so I should say before I carry on that all of this work, particularly the minimum wage work is published in uh, various forms, sort of four or five different articles, and if people are interested, I could pass it on to Piotr from American Journal of Agricultural Economics, International Labor Review, Labor, the ISA Journal of Labor and Development, and so on. So all this stuff doesn't exist only here, but the detailed work you can find in the journal articles. One thing we do have, though, is almost matching the small share of agricultural uh, employment is fairly large shares of uh, industry or manufacturing employment. So it's broadly the secondary industry, but it captures manufacturing employment, which in South Africa is similar to Mexico, and I think I've got Brazil here and so on. So I often put the Latin American or the LAC uh, region numbers because that's our comparator set actually uh, in, in the South African context. So we have fairly decent employment in manufacturing. There's of course a more detailed story about whether manufacturing is too capital intensive and whether we uh, uh, like a Vietnam, whether we are not focused, unlike Vietnam, not focused on light manufacturing, labor intensive jobs. So another way to look at it is just compare us on another s set of statistics. I've given you the unemployment rate, but our labor force participation rate, despite that high unemployment rate, is incredibly low. Low shares of agriculture, a repetition of the industry employment figures, but then also worryingly a large share of public sector employment creation. It's not really a queuing model. Um, it's not really rent-seeking yet, uh, buying of political votes yet in the South African context, but it is noteworthy that you've got very large growth in public sector employment. So that's essentially the, the makeup of this labor market, right? That you've got low labor force participation rates, low shares of employment in the informal sector, surprising dominance and growth of public sector employment. As I say, we can talk about that labor it's not, later. It's not yet buying votes. Um, but there is really no rural employment opportunity uh, based essentially on our historical past of moving, physically moving black people away from productive land into uh, what were called homelands or Bantustans. Um, but, but at least there is something going on in industrial employment. So into this labor market uh, and this, uh, this middle-income country, the state does promulgate and did promulgate minimum wages since 2001, more or less. But within that, uh, and I'm thinking of the discussion earlier this morning, there's a fairly sophisticated uh, system of industrial relations. So we've had, historically, um, institutionalized bargaining. So if you think of industrial councils or bargaining councils, they represent about 33% of all formal employment in the South African economy. So that is um, essentially unions, right, and employers who are organized in federations bargaining. Bargaining happens at the sectoral level, sometimes at the plant level. Some of you may be aware of the very violent, Thomas Piketty's book opens up with the very violent um, deaths of mine workers in, in, in South Africa, in Marikana. A lot of that, uh, that bargaining would have been institutionalized bargaining, but it actually represents a breakdown of that bargaining that caused the violent, uh, uh, violence that we saw at the mine. Uh, we can talk about that if people want to. Um, but our focus is the second system, that where workers are underrepresented or, or unorganized, the state steps in as assumes to be a benevolent state and institutes sectoral minimum wages. So the minimum wages are set at a sectoral level. We do not have a national minimum wage. So it's very similar to Costa Rica um, and a few of the other Latin American countries. Um, but in addition, uh, which is not said here, the minimum wage is set by a minimum wage set bo a setting body. So I chaired that commission, it's a rotating position in its first conception in post-94, post-apartheid, and we then gather government, employer, and union representatives that are broadly drawn but not represented by the sector, but just broadly representative of the, the tripartite groups. Um, and the idea is that the chair being a government rep or an academic rep 
would then be able to mediate the determination of the wages. So it's essentially a form of bargaining that happens uh, to determine the level of the wage. So what do we have? We have one in every five workers that are covered by these sectoral minimum wages. They run the gamut of domestic workers. So if you think of most developing countries, there's a very large household services sector. So domestic workers working in households, private households. There's uh, private security guards. So uh, uh, part of our violence is also a very high incidence of crime. And so the private security industry is uh, fairly rife. Um, the taxi industry, uh, in the retail sector, outside of the large cap companies, and then, of course, in forestry and agriculture. We only consider six of the ten minimum wages because of data issues. So um, they're, 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 some of the workers are impossible to cover, um, children in performing arts and so on, so we can't capture them in the data. And in other cases, the minimum wage came after the data that we were working on at the time was available. How are minimum wages set? They set either by area, so urban or rural, or in some cases by occupation. So you've got an incredibly complex um, minimum wage structure at a sectoral level that we've argued even in, as we've had with colleagues in Costa Rica with the Ministry of Labor, that you've got such a complex structure, and I'll come back to that later, but a very poor enforcement regime. And it's the interaction between the two which I think is interesting in the developing country context. So what did we have? Uh, just a little bit about our method. We have 15 waves of our labor force survey, which is a standard nationally representative labor force survey. We treat it as a pooled um, uh, data set between 2000 and 2007. And at various stages of the different minimum wages, uh, which were set at different stages in that period, we, of course, have a pre and a post. So what we institute is essentially a difference in difference estimation strategy, but two approaches to that. We have two specifications which I'll discuss. But what are we trying to test? We're trying to test, of course, the, the first most important one, the canonical one, which is did it reduce employment? Then were there intensive margin adjustments, which I think is crucial, in the, at least in the developing country uh, setting, which is do you find that employers manage the response to the minimum wage, they manage the wage bill rather than just the extensive margin. So the fact that they may re reduce hours of work is really, really important. Uh, we also look at non-wage benefits. Now, think developing country. In a developing country context, the one key non-wage benefit is actually the provision of a written contract. So many of these vulnerable workers do not even have a written contract. And the minimum wage includes a whole series of these non-wage stipulations. And so we test whether that improved um, uh, um, w with the introduction of the minimum wage. And then, of course, we want to really test whether it actually had the intended outcome that the politicians wanted, which is to increase wages. So uh, the first... Um, Specification involves the identification of a control group. We didn't do uh, any propensity score matching. We simply defined our control groups. You can look through that if you want to. Um, and that then gives us, uh, so people laughed at the equations in the last one, so I'll go through this quickly. The first specification, of course, for, uh, this is almost insulting to this audience, but that's the coefficient we're interested in, as you know, which is are individuals in the treatment group relative, uh, relative to the control group in the post relative to the pre-law uh, uh, period uh, impacted on in any way um, given our dependent variable. So that's what we're interested in. We're interested in beta 3, which is, of course, our difference in difference term. The problem, of course, in the literature is that the control group, if you go back to the Card and Kruger work, the, the control group makes people queasy because of these spillover effects and, you know, you can't observe whether people actually end up in minimum wage sectors or in non-minimum wage sectors and so on. So we we, the second specification of our difference and difference strategy is a wage gap variable. Again, as I say, all, all the details are in the various journal articles, but um, this guy is really important because it would suggest, and it, and it is important in a strange other way, which I'll come back to. This is a measure of the gap, right, between the minimum wage and some measure of the pre-minimum wage level. So in other words, the notion is that the larger the gap, and it's normalized, right? The larger the gap pre the minimum wage law, right? You'd expect that the catch up would be larger. So there's some notion there that employers are responding positively to the minimum wage. And if we think of the previous uh, uh, panel about uh, people below the minimum wage, we have a model in mind here that there's going to be absolute or relative compliance with the minimum wage. And that's a crucial assumption 
and I'll come back to that later because it's some of the work that uh, myself and Ravi Kanbur and others are doing on measures of relative compliance. So, so you may find that employers do not respond right up to the minimum wage, but they actually respond positively to the minimum wage. And that's what's driving this measure of our wage gap, actually. That we feel that it doesn't matter whether employers actually go above the minimum wage or stay or go right up to the minimum wage, what measure, m matters is that the gap will narrow. So they will respond positively. The notion, of course, on our difference in difference term is that the larger the gap is, right, in the post-law period, um, the, the, the larger the impact on whatever the outcome variable will be, right, employment or wages. So I thought I'll put this here. I know we were told uh, earlier about our obsession with wage effects. Well, here's a graphic description of our um, employment effects. Here's a graphic description of every single study, at least in the Newmark and Washer paper, right, of every single elasticity of minimum wage with respect to employment, right? Um, the lighter figures, the lighter bars are the significant coefficients. So that's also instructive, right? So they're not that many uh, light bars. So there are a huge number of them are actually insignificant. Even this one, this is the A-barred one that was massive but was actually insignificant. The average, the mean and the median are the blue lines. The mean and the median tells you that you've got minimum wage employment effects that are actually, even though we've got all these pervasive studies, that are actually fairly benign. I think the mean is about 0.23. So within that, we add the South Africa study, and here's our first impact, which is on those sectors, I've excluded agriculture because that, as you'll see, is a very different outcome. But for all our non-ag sectors, right, for retail, for domestic workers, forestry, taxi, and security, the impact, that's our difference in difference term, our preferred specification, which is the wage gap, is insignificant. So the first big result is outside of agriculture, there's been no significant impact on employment in this high unemployment society, right, of the minimum wage. And so, so just for policymakers, you know, that's the first starting point is how can you institute minimum wages in a high unemployment society, right? Oh, when you do the numbers, it turns out that it's had a fairly benign impact on employment or insignificant impact. Uh, this is mislabeled. This should be wages. Um, sorry about that. So, um, and I've got both my specifications, but there's the more important specification, which is the impact on wages. And you can see that in every single case, not large effects, but you have had the social protection or the poverty impact, if you like, which is an increase in wages. Was there an adjustment, though, at the intensive margin? That's really important because it's possible that at the extensive margin there's no change in employment, but you adjust hours of work downwards. And so that's a really important uh, storyline which I think may be playing itself out even in the developed country setting. And so what we find, if I could just take it to the second rectangle, which is my preferred specification, you find that at least in the case of the taxi industry, Right? There is a reduction in the hours of work in the face of the minimum wage. So taxi, the taxi industry in particular has responded at the intensive margin. If we want to cheat a little bit and take our less preferred specification, this is the control group relative to the treatment group, there are intensive margin adjustments for the retail sector and for security. So there's some action at the intensive margin that is interesting um, in terms of employers responding. So for agriculture, it's a very, very different story, right? Um, and usually when I present to the Ministry of Labor, we present it to Parliament recently, they love the first part of the story, then they don't like the story. Um, and, and they start questioning the method and everything. It's interesting to see the sort of shift. Uh, here's, you, know, you actually don't even need to present the metrics and the difference in difference estimates. This just tells you everything, right? This is um, the treatment group, so it's agricultural workers, 2000 right through to 2007. Of course, this is where the minimum wage gets instituted. Our weighted um, estimates of employment it hovers around 800,000, and then you can see that. When the minimum wage gets instituted, you lose about 150 or 200,000 workers immediately. Right? And so there's immediate negative shock in the face of the minimum wage. It's very, very clear. We've, our our, our um, AJAE paper discusses why we think it's a very special and different sector, but I'm happy to take questions later on. You'll see that if, even if you do FTEs, which turns out to be important, uh, on full-time equivalents, there's also a reduction. Um, and um, the, the, the third... So, so, so there's the employment effect. 
The full-time equivalence tells us that there's something also going on in terms of intensive margin adjustments, which I'll come back to. But you'll notice, uh, let me just get to, yeah. Here's the fraction that were below the minimum wage. So that's a measure of non-compliance. It's what we're calling V0. So it's just simply the proportion below the minimum wage. It doesn't say the gap. I'll come back to that. But notice that even with the minimum wage, there's still 58% of workers after the institution of the minimum wage and the employment losses that are below the minimum wage. So you've got a combination of effects going on. You've got the, the large employment reduction. You've got the intensive margin adjustment, which is the reduction in hours of work or part-time work, right? But you also have a continuation of non-compliance or another way to look at it is an improvement in wages. So that's a really important and interesting result, is, and it comes back to the wage gap story, is that the, 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 the level at which the gap, what we call V1, has actually narrowed. So they haven't moved up to the minimum wage, all employers, but they've actually narrowed the gap. Uh, of importance in the South African context, so we spent time actually visiting employers. There was an employer servicing a very large retail chain, uh, and the employer paid the minimum wage, but he had no idea that he had to issue written contracts to all his farm workers. And we actually witnessed him getting a penalty from the labor inspector and so on. But, in, but the data does show there was an improvement, at least in written contract provisions to, to these workers. So just to make sure, we do our standard sort of uh, uh, difference in difference numbers. And with our controls, there's your negative impact. It's not huge, but there is a negative impact on the probability of being employed right, uh, as a farm worker relative, uh, sorry, in areas where the wage gap is the largest in the post-law period relative to the pre-law period. So confirmation um, in terms of the employment effects. Um, wages do go up, right, so wages have increased, right, in the post-law period. Contract coverage, we saw that as well, right. There's a reduction uh, sorry, an increase in the proportion of workers who have a written contract, so non-wage benefits improve. Fundamentally important in the developing country context if you think of protection of workers and so on. Here's the hours of work adjustment. So in other words, did farmers reduce, farm owners reduce hours worked? And um, uh, so l let, me, let me restate that. Do you find that there's some change despite the reduction in number of employed workers, right, in hours worked, and we find that the coefficient is positive. And so when we did, so it's, it's part of the revise and resubmit with the <laughs> journal referees, was we went back to this, and what, what we realized was that farmers were increasing the number of hours worked of a lower number of workers and got rid of part-time workers. So essentially you had a switch, right, away from part-time workers and increasing the number of hours worked of the existing workforce. And what it does, it reinforces segmentation in the labor market, reinforces dualism, uh, and of course those that are insiders. So what are our quick sort of um, set of results? We've got an increase in real hourly wages for non-ag uh, sectors, no significant employment effects. There is some action in terms of the intensive margin. So in some sectors, depending on your choice of specification, you do get. Uh, but for agriculture, this is where it's very different. You've got a very clear, strong impact uh, in response to the law. So employment falls significantly, right? Um, and then how it happens, the way, the mechanics of it is that you've got adjustment at the intensive margin as part-time workers lose their jobs and the existing workers who remain see an increase in their hours worked. So a quick addendum around this sort of enforcement stuff. National data, which I don't show because I don't have time, um, shows that 45% of covered workers are paid below the legislated minima, right? So despite the minimum wage, if you do that now, if you do the so sort of estimates on that same sample, 45% um, of workers are still being paid below the minimum wage, which is a standard problem in the developing country setting, of course, is uh, low levels of compliance. But one thing that we try to do is understand this notion of what we call um, this index of violation, which is drawn from this class of poverty measures. So looking at absolute versus relative poverty, we actually look at absolute violation versus relative violation. It's simply the average distance below the minimum wage. 
what you find is that relative levels of violation are also fairly high. So workers are still earning about 36% below the minimum wage. Right? So even of the 45% that are below, they are earning 36% below the minimum wage. Right? And there's a fairly sort of neat way of doing this. But what's the interesting thing? And so there's, so there's work that we think about, which is this interaction between inspection and enforcement and what's going on, and can you model enforcement and so on. The income and expenditure, uh, sorry, not the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the IES, which is our um, inspectorate, right, in the Department of Labor in South Africa is severely under-resourced, which is a standard sort of story in developing countries, and the literature asks the question, are policymakers deliberately turning a blind eye? Because, of course, you can institute the minimum wage to show that you're interested in the workforce and in, in poverty reduction, but you can turn a blind eye to enforcement. And a lot of that is happening. The state of Gujarat, many of the Indian economists argue, did exactly that, that uh, the current prime minister of India turned a, a very strong blind eye away from enforcement of the minimum wage. So, but is there some response despite this lack of enforcement in terms of relative levels of violation? So what I present, which is my third last slide, is an estimate of this violation gap, which is the average gap, right, below the minimum wage um, for, in this case, for farm workers. What you have are the 2001, 2002 estimates, right, which is pre, okay, and then post the minimum wage. And what you essentially see right, is this blip right up here, which is a reduction, right, in the share of workers or an increase in the share of workers at these high levels of violation. So essentially, you've got this closing of the minimum wage gap or the violation gap, which is really, really interesting in response to the law. Um, and so what we've done for Chile, uh, India has done it, and South Africa, of course, is to calculate these violation indices, which is... Um, uh, either the proportion below, the distance below, and then you could, because of the foster griothorbic poverty of measure, you could actually switch that alpha and, and increase the violation parameter to get V2, V3, and so on. But, but, but the really interesting thing is how do employers respond in the face of a minimum wage? We're so used to just looking at the spike, but there may be a range of responses below the minimum wage. So finally, um, as you can tell, we are a high unemployment emerging market economy. Um, I didn't really speak about our growth path dependency, but essentially, based on heavy resources, uh, um, uh, capital-intensive manufacturing, that's our growth trap, in my view. Um, within this environment, the state has instituted with one eye on the electorate, remembering this is a post-apartheid society. We're supposed to be delivering um, social welfare to the previously excluded, so it's minimum wages are an obvious thing. Um, we find the insignificant impacts on employment in, in minimum wages, um, from minimum wages in every sector except agriculture. And so, in a way, it just makes the debate around, which is where we are now, a debate around a national minimum wage even more um, worrying, right? So, the state, through the ruling party, has instituted a, a statement from the executive that we will be instituting a national minimum wage. So, part of our parliamentary briefings now is to think about uh, how do we collapse these uh, uh, different sectoral minimum wages into one national minimum wage. If we had insignificant employment effects across all sectoral minimum wages, it would be an easy discussion. With one eye on agriculture, it may mean uh, that the discussions around a national minimum wage going forward will be very difficult. Okay, thanks very much.